What's going on everybody? Jeff Holiday here and today I have a wild, wild, horrifying story to share with you. Surprise, surprise, that's what we do on this channel. Now, the subject of today's video, and this might be a little bit of a long one, is probably the most innocuous and harmless sounding quackery you might think of. It's called German New Medicine. It sounds harmless, right? Well, out of all of the things that I've talked about on my channel, this ranks up really, really high in terms of potential body count. And the reasons why for it are actually quite stunning. How some people could fall for something so ludicrously stupid is actually beyond me. But before we get started, there's something that we need to address really, really quick. One of the things that's frustrating about German New Medicine is that it's promoted by people who are not doctors, very commonly chiropractors. Surprise, surprise. However, it was purchased a bit of legitimacy because its founder, Reich Geerd Hammer, or Hammer, or Hammer, was actually a doctor. But he also lost his license back in the 80s, and, and you'll see why in just a little bit. So since nobody is actually like a real doctor doctor, I'm very happy to announce that I can then effectively challenge them on the same intellectual level that they try and bring to the table. Because you see, I am now a doctor of divinity. That's right, I have my doctorate. It cost me 20 bucks. So at this point, we're on the same page, equal footing. Oh, no more amateur hour. I'm in it to win it. Let's go, boys. Figure you might as well like see me in my work uniform now, you know? Ah. <sighs> Fits like a glove. Now, in order to try and decompile this crazy story, which is very dense and very involved, we're going to have to try and take this in a weird sort of stepping direction. What we're going to do is first we're going to explore who the man behind this was on a surface level, and then we're going to look into what he developed this German new medicine to be, his five distinct biological laws. And while we're doing that, we're going to take a look at some of the people who are promoting and pushing this as a theory. And then lastly, at the very end of this video, because I have to tantalize you to stay for a video this fucking long, we're going to look into the true in-depth horror of what this actually does. Now, for the purposes of this video, I don't really know how his name is supposed to be pronounced. Hammer? Hamer? Whatever. I'm going to go with Hamer. Dr. Hamer was born in the 30s in Germany, and he ended up getting his medical license sometime in the 60s. Now, it's interesting to note that when you look back and try and investigate his life, the people who are hardcore into German New Medicine have all these, these stories they like to tell about him. They like to say that he was a psychologist or an oncologist, none of which is true. Uh, that he was the head of a hospital or even an emergency room department. Again, not true at all. Well, you know, I, I consider Dr. Harmer to be a genius. And he has this, this wealth of knowledge. He's, he was uh, uh, not only studying medicine, he also studied physics. And he also studied religions. He, was a, he has his doctorate in theology. So he was well versed in all areas. You know, his first book was called Cancer, Disease of the Soul. Now, in a truly, truly bizarre series of circumstances, Hamer's son, Dirk, back in the late 70s, was on a yacht. He was on a yacht with the Crown Prince of Italy, and the Crown Prince of Italy discharged a firearm, and it struck Dr. Hamer's son and killed him. Like, th this, isn't, this isn't just, like, something that people just say. Like, this was actually in the news. It was actually a very huge, big, big thing. Uh, Dr. Hammer held the royal family accountable, but ultimately nothing really happened to the crown prince. Uh, and Dirk Hammer, Dirk Hammer, wow. If he, if, he was, if, he was, if he was alive today, I bet he'd make a lot of money in the adult film industry. Anyway, uh, Dirk Hammer was still dead, and Dr. Hammer fell into immense grief. And out of that grief, 
he apparently lost his goddamn mind. I, he was already a substandard doctor. He was already pretty much failed at everything else he was trying to do, including being an inventor. But now he was grieving the loss of his child. And, and understandably, that could shatter anybody's psyche. It's a difficult thing to have to deal with. But three years later, Dr. Hamer developed prostate cancer. Now, when you get such a horrible diagnosis as a severe cancer, it's very common to look back on your life and try and think of, like, what choices could I have made that led me to develop cancer? That's very natural. I imagine pretty much anybody who gets diagnosed with cancer goes through that. Well, Dr. Hamer, apparently in his shattered, fractured mind, decided that it was the psychological stress of having his son accidentally killed that caused his prostate cancer. And this would become the foundational concept behind German new medicine, that a trauma, a shock to a person's psyche, would manifest immediately as both a mental, a psychological, and a physical ailment at the same time. But it gets weirder. Now, to say that these rules, these five biological rules that Dr. Hamer, Dr. Hamer, developed after he, he, he decided arbitrarily that his prostate cancer was caused by the death of his son, to say that these are convoluted and make no sense would be to do a huge disservice to how batshit they are. I mean, this is... I don't even think there's enough spray paint in the world that I could huff to get enough brain damage that this would make sense to me. I don't know how people do this. I really don't. But I'm going to do my best to try and explain it as succinctly as I possibly can. <sighs> okay. First things first. When you suffer a serious traumatic event, it has to be a shock. All of a sudden, you didn't expect it. All of a sudden, <gasps> wow, something happened. You have just experienced what he likes to call a Dirk Hamer syndrome. And at this point, I really want to point this out. The, the, the people who follow this methodology, they absolutely love to tell the same stories. And I'm going to display this for you every time it comes up. For instance, they always like to, when they describe the Dirk Hamer syndrome or the, or the shock, they all like to say very similar things. Check this out. In GNM, we call this a DHS, a Dirk Hamer syndrome, in honor of Dr. Hamer's son. So yeah. in honor of, of Dirk, he calls it uh, Dirk Hammer syndrome. All right. Rule number one, also known as the iron rule of cancer. What this basically means is when you experience a Dirk Hammer syndrome uh, or a shock, then it is going to manifest physically, mentally, and emotionally at the same time. And that the location of that dysfunction is going to be relative to the shock. I know that doesn't make any sense, but just bear with me. Law number two is the law of two phases. And the law of two phases is kind of analogous when they describe it, depending on who you're, who you're listening to at the time, because there are different schools of thought in the German New Medicine world. And we'll get there soon. Don't worry. Believes that... It's an analogous to a day and night cycle, where during the day you have an active period and at night you have a low or depressive period. And that you can also attribute how you heal to this type of thing. Now, oh god, this is so frustrating. Effectively, what it's trying to convey when it talks about this is that we go through a period of cyclic nature in our lives where we are very active during the day and at night we rest. But when we are experiencing a moment of dysfunction or disease, we lose that ability of rest at night. Instead, we're stuck in an active, func active function of activity, of, of, of movement, of constant, like, stress. It's stress. That, that you have lost the ability to have that delineation between the two and that there is a perpetual stressor event that is going on. And in fact, that stressor event is the thing that is causing your dysfunction or your disease and keeping it from, from effectively healing itself. And this is actually really important. I know, I know none of this makes sense. I know I'm so sorry. Just hang in there. But one of the most important parts, and you can see it with this graph up here, 
is that effectively what they try and convey is when you're going through this healing moment, when you're healing from a psychological stress, it's actually the pain or the agony of the disease, that feeling that you feel, how horrible you feel with cancer, that's actually the, the experience of healing. You already had that developed because you it developed spontaneously when you had that psychological trauma, that you got that cancer the moment you had that trauma, that shock. And the reason why you feel so bad now is because you're healing. Okay, so there's a conflict, but I'm not getting sick only when it's over. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So people don't get ill when they divorce or lose their business or lose a loved one. They it's get ill when it's resolved. And this is part of the healing process. Well, that's kind of a crazy concept. Is that very common between uh, German new medicine practitioners? You do want to be cautious about medications because most medications that are used, what happens is it takes you out of this um, parasympathetic vagotonic state where you're symptomatic. And what the chemicals of the pharmaceuticals do is actually puts your body physiologically back into the sympathetic atonia state. So you're not feeling pain anymore and you're like, woohoo, I feel great. But if you want to heal, you actually need to go through the course of the healing. Oh, I see. Um, well, we will definitely be getting into their feelings on uh, modern medicine and pharmaceuticals in just a little bit. We'll get there. Pain is healing. Where in the hell have we heard that before? This is when you have to welcome pain. Pain is your friend. Pain is healing. It's kind of a weird trope, isn't it? All right, number three. Law three is the ontogenetic system of cancer and cancer equivalents. And what this basically is, is an, ex is an explanation of how stressor events can develop into specific diseases and ailments. <laughs> this is where it gets really fucking weird. Now, to kind of give you a basic example, um, let's say... Let's say that you had an immediate shock of something, uh, a concept that was very disturbing to you that you found hard to swallow. The, 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 the phrase, <laughs> I can't believe I have to try and explain this. This is so dumb. <laughs> Somebody said something to you that was just so hard to swallow. That could manifest itself <laughs> as a cold or a throat infection. No, I'm not kidding. If, if, <laughs> if you experience an indigestible moral conflict, it could manifest itself as a tummy ache. So let's give an example. Indigestible morsel cancer. This is an endodermally derived tissue coming from the brainstem. So the conflict is not being able to digest a morsel. We gave an example of that earlier. You know, an animal would bite off a bone too much. We could be angry about something, something concerning a family member, something concerning money. You're just a situation that you just cannot digest. Um, okay. <laughs> I can't, dude. I can't. I can't. I can't. Look, I'm a doctor and I'm having a hard enough time with this as it is. <laughs> oh, my God. And also, like, and here, here's another really, really crazy one. If a woman loses a child, it can manifest as breast cancer because uh, the the connection to uh, the mother and uh, the child is through the breast, uh, through the breastfeeding, and so that feeling of loss will manifest inside of the breast. Watch this. Here, where the mechanism here is very oh, well okay. um, showed like that. Um, okay. uh, shown. If we, uh, uh, if we, for example, see the picture on the left side up here. So that's an accident? That's an accident. It's, it's, like it's a, a child being run over by a car. It's a child that has let loose the, the hand of her mother, runs onto the street, and then is uh, being overrun by a car. So an estuary conflict could be a mother standing on the sidewalk holding her child's hand. Um, the child sees a dog across, 
across the street, darts away from her mother, runs out into the street, and a car comes by and hits, hits the child. And this is the DHS, this is the psychobiological conflict because a mother, what does she want? She wants a healthy child. So at that very moment, on the level of the psyche, she can't think about anything else any longer. She, she only thinks about her child. In that moment, the mother is, has a conflict shock. This unexpected thing happened, she wasn't prepared for it, and all of a sudden, she sets into motion from the area of the cerebellar mesoderm, the motion is set for the glands of the breast to proliferate in at the same time the conflict shock will end up in the brain at a very particular relay yeah. uh, at a very particular relay here we see this woman she has got a nodule in her uh, left breast mm -hmm. okay so uh, she's a right-hander she must be a right-hander to get a nodule in her left breast because there is a child concerned you know she's yeah. very con very much concerned about her child it would be the same if she was concerned about her mother but here it is the child yeah. and it's the same side uh, the sides would switch uh, if you're left left or right-handed right. so that's one important aspect you want to know okay. yes now even down to the level of understanding whether it's the right or the left breast um, dr hammer has an explanation based on biology, based on handedness, because a right-handed woman, because she's right-handed, she biologically associates her, her left side with her child. Yes. So now she is developing breast cancer? Or now what she's is developing it? breast cancer because from the psychic level, it, it strikes the brain, the relay of the, uh, the milk-producing alveoli. Okay, yeah. the milk-producing alveoli, they will start to increase. There will be more cells producing milk. Form additional breast gland cells for a purpose. And the purpose is for the nourishment and the healing of her offspring that she is so gravely concerned about. And so in that moment, the body starts proliferating breast gland tissue. Law four, the ontogenetic system of microbes and this entails that diseases are not contagious um, and bacteria and fungus are in our bodies and are there for healing the the effective description of this which really isn't necessarily as important as the first three laws is stating very specifically that diseases are not communicable um, very commonly, German New Medicine practitioners will believe that viruses aren't real, so they're also AIDS denialists, um, that you cannot contract anything, there is no such thing as a carcinogen, that every ailment, and I mean this, every ailment, aside from physical like trauma, like getting wounded, everything other than that is all because of emotional shock. They don't believe in germs. They don't believe in germs. And they also have a, a rather suspiciously spooky similar uh, a notion to another wingnut, uh, hmm, 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 uh, who believes that basically your bacteria and your fungus are there for the purposes specifically of helping your body heal. And there's no other purpose. There's no such thing as a bad fungus or this, that, and the other thing. Um, but they do have... <laughs> <laughs> they do have a belief of effectively kind of reprogramming your fungus um, in that if you do what they say you should do in, in dealing with these conflicts, it will help your fungus be programmed for healing. Yes. And last but not least is law number five. Now, this one is very contentious. Some people interpret it in other ways. I'm going to use my favorite one that I found, and that's from... Dr. Melissa Sell, uh, and this is law number five, uh, quintessence. And the basic concept behind this is some happy dippy, happy go lucky, no big deal, the body's not fucky, the body is perfect. The body was designed perfect. Disease is not an accident and it is not an error. It is there on purpose. There is a natural order to why we get disease and why we get sick. And that effectively we are beautiful light beings. We just have to understand why we get disease. And this ties in the whole thing, the whole big 
paradigm of the German New Medicine is that they believe that disease itself, disease and dysfunction of the body exists because we need to process agony and pain and suffering in order to heal from our psychological problems, to heal from all the things that have hurt us, that the real pain of existence is the things that can just happen to us that hurt our feelings. And that just manifests as hurt in our bodies. And it's because of this that they actually will actively warn you away from going to the doctor. They will. Because, and they firmly believe this, that if you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you that you have cancer, that doctor has doomed you to die. Because now you are not going to be focusing on all the things that just hurt your feelings. Instead, you're going to be focusing on the fact that you're dying and then you're never going to get better because you're now in effectively a death spiral and the doctor caused that. When really what the doctor should be doing is saying, hey there bucko, you just got to work through some shit and your cancer will just go right away. I mean, these people, th their denialism is so absolutely wacky. Like, they, Melissa Sell likes to claim that uh, viruses are not real and no electron microscope pictures have been taken of viruses. Really? But furthermore, you'll actually have some people who are super into it and they'll, they'll claim all sorts of wacky ass stuff. For instance, there's this amazing clip that I have here. Uh, they, they're like, well, you see, these people, they believe that uh, after taking the genetic uh, testing, uh, they go and get their breasts removed. And now the men, uh, if they think they might get testicle cancer, they are removing the testicles. Even men have decided to take off their testicles because their grandfather has had something, uh, had a testicle cancer yeah. before. And these are also the same people who will say, it's important for me that once you understand that you get much more relaxed about diseases and you don't go to a doctor anymore, except you have broken your leg or something. And uh, it's so easy to understand. Mm -hmm. and it, is, it is even understandable for a nine-year-old if you, if you explain it correctly. You That's know. why you did all these children books, because children are more open to that. They are not brainwashed mm -hmm. like we said before. Yeah, you people are psychopaths. Now, before we really get into the hard and the deep, because from here, from here, we jump off the cliff and we go straight into the nasty, the mean, the horrifying, the gritty and the shitty. And I'm going to tell you exactly who is who you need to be watching out for and who is pushing this shit today. But before we do, I really, I really want to share this with you because it's just so good. Um, Dr. Hamer also believed that his voice could heal people. Yes, this is some of his music. That's enough. Yeah, that was him singing. He randomly recorded himself singing this song, and then there was a very sick little girl, and he, she liked his song, I guess. It sounds like a made-up story to me. Um, but... Allegedly, she then listened to him singing on record for a couple weeks over and over again, and it cured her. Wonderful. So getting back to the history of Dr. Hamer, Dr. Hamer, he, he starts developing this concept after he gets the ball cancer and he survives it. And he starts putting together these laws. Now, in 1981, he went to a university and tried to basically get a professorship by explaining out his theories. His theories were summarily demolished and he was denied the professorship, uh, obviously. But one of the reasons why he really thought he could convince people was because he thought that he had the, the proof, the actual hardline proof with CT scans. And in these CT scans, he was showing, ah, you see, there is uh, a, a, a dark cloud. This is the manifestation of uh, the Dirk Hamer syndrome, which in reality, they were CT scan artifacts, something that happened very commonly back then. And magically, because now we have better CT technology, don't happen anymore. Nobody has ever replicated these with any consistency in today's modern context of biomedical science. It is routinely debunked because, of course it is. 
This is the dumbest concept I've ever heard of my... Anyway, it's, that's not important. Let's keep going. Now, one of the more troubling things about this story is that we don't actually know how many people Dr. Hammer treated to death. But we know some. We have some estimates as well, and we'll get to those in just a little bit. But one of the first ones we do have documentation of is his wife. His wife passed away in 1985 of breast cancer. Now, Dr. Hammer liked to claim that th this is because she was skeptical of the German new medicine, but also would then later claim that he had already cured her of her breast cancer no less than five times before, I guess, she just didn't believe enough and ended up dying. I... I guess. But a year later, in 1986, his license to practice medicine was revoked. And this was because of very troubling instances and, and court cases that were being brought forward of him, well, effectively malpractice and telling people that, no, 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 you don't need medical treatment for your diseases. What you need is uh, feel good vibes or whatever. So he lost his medical license. That should be that, right? He's not going to practice anymore, right? Whose channel do you think you're watching right now? Come on! Now, the most well-known victim of Dr. Hammer was a little girl by the name of Olivia. Olivia was six years old, and she was diagnosed with a Wilms tumor, which is a very, very treatable childhood tumor. It happens sometimes, easy to take care of, no big deal. Problem is, of course, that Olivia's parents were then convinced by Dr. Hammer that that's not actually what she needed to do, and in fact, she was more likely to die if she stayed in the care of regular doctors. Mm-hmm. So what did they do? Well, they took their little girl and they fled Austria. They fled Austria to try and get away from having to, uh, well, uh, treat their child's cancer. Now, this, this continued, it made national headlines, it was a big, big deal, and in fact, the president of Austria himself had to reach out and be like, you need to come home, you need to get Olivia treatment, and so eventually, they did. And this is great. Problem is, it had been left for a very long time, and this poor little girl had a tumor that was several kilograms. She's a little girl, that's a big goddamn tumor. Now... I'm happy to say that she was treated successfully and she survived. If I'm not mistaken, she's still alive today. And her parents had an eight-month uh, suspended jail sentence. But that's the one that made the biggest news. But it is by far not the worst and only a drop in the bucket. Probably one of the most heartbreaking cases that I came across when I was researching this was a young woman by the name of Mikola. I believe it was, was Mikola or Michaela. We'll go with Mikola. Mikola had breast cancer. Um, she started getting chemotherapy, showed positive results uh, to the treatment, and the doctors are projected that she had a very good chance of surviving and beating this cancer. And then came Dr. Hamer. Now, the results of her deciding to stop chemotherapy uh, and, and trust in what Dr. Hamer was saying was effectively that the cancer came right back, and it came back with a vengeance. She had a very strong disagreement with her husband, Gilbert. Gilbert left for a little while. And unfortunately, Mikola died. Mikola died very, very badly. The cancer had spread all through her chest wall. And she died in absolute agony, screaming for days. This woman probably suffered more than most people I can think of. A nasty, horrible unnecessary and prolonged death. Gilbert maintains a website where he talks about what happened to his uh, former wife, and there are some very troubling pictures on it showing the spread of her breast cancer. Um, for medical purposes, this is linked down below. But what I really wanted to share with you is how he ends this entry on the website. Mikola had so unbelievably terrible pain. She was so ill that a doctor had been called, who right away ordered her to be brought into hospice. Never before the personnel of the hospice had seen such misery. A human who, alive, rots, and is only mere skin and bones. Her whole upper body is open. The back is open, completely rotten. All stinks from rotten flesh. Mikola endured infernal pain, 
Despite strongest medications, she cried of pain. She cried down the whole house. Now, I really have to make this clear. This is by no means isolated incidents. I have linked down below in the description uh, websites that have uh, stories of many, many people who suffered, many who died, not just at the hands of Dr. Hamer, but the people who followed in his footsteps. Now, Hamer himself, he did serve prison sentences. 1992, 1997, uh, got out in 98... And then from 2004 to 2006 in France. Now, this is him bouncing around, sometimes in Cologne, sometimes in France. Uh, he set up a, a clinic in Spain, and then when things got too hot there, he fled to Norway. Now, this should remind you of somebody. Who should it remind you of? Some some weird quack that I've, I've made extensive videos on who does unproven and brutal treatments and people die... And then they have to flee countries. Hmm. I don't know. It's right on the tip of my tongue. But suffice to say, some websites even calculate that potentially the number of victims from Dr. Hamer himself were in the hundreds. In fact, there's a website called deathsect.com, which is entirely devoted to looking into these types of things. It's pretty crazy. I think it's about half in German, so it's not fully translated yet. But this is some nutty stuff. It's pretty crazy. But if you want to hear how really crazy it is, how even more nefarious and really fucked up it is, check this out. Dr. Hamer was a raging fucking anti-Semite. Uh-huh. This charmer, this wonderful fucking charmer here, was thoroughly convinced that the, the German new medicine that he had discovered was actually already known by the secret Jewish cabal, and that they had been hiding the truth from the Gentiles, all because they wanted the rest of the world to be enslaved by, by their, their, their medical industry that's all run by the Jews. And <laughs> I just, I can't, man, I can't. Hearing about this crazy German doctor who is, like, letting people suffer and die. No, not, not that one, not that one, this one, that one, right, that one. Um, and that he's also a raging anti-Semite is just... It's like, it's like, it's like sprinkles on top of the shit cupcake. You know what I mean? So where does that leave us today? Well, today there are definitely people who follow in the footsteps of Dr. Hamer. There's several groups, in fact. And if you look into them deep enough, you realize that these groups, they butt heads. They got some beef. Oh, yeah. It's really fascinating. The ones that came out of it is, first and foremost, the, there's German New Medicine Canada. And it's, as far as we know... The only one that was truly supported by Dr. Hammer. That that was his successor. That's at least that's how Elsidora Locker uh, likes likes to put it. Elsidora, for the record, was this charming lady that you saw earlier in the video. We are dissected right down to the DNA now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're no longer seen as a whole. Uh huh. But then we also have these other groups like Biology Totale or Total Biology. Uh, and then there's also the International Meta Medicine Association. And this one is actually pretty fascinating. The IMM IMMA will very loudly proclaim that Dr. Hamer's methods and some of the troubling things about him, well, we're not on board with that. But they follow the same five biological laws, so I don't really know what they're trying to sell us. But speaking of cell, then you also have independent people like Dr. Melissa Cell, a YouTuber who is a chiropractor uh, who tries to flood effectively the entire YouTube market with videos about German New Medicine. This German New Medicine that I have been explaining to you what it does right now. I'm thinking you need to uh, perhaps consider a career change, Dr. Melissa. But at the end of it all, that's pretty much where we stand with German New Medicine. It's kind of a fringe group, but the potential adherence to it is quite large, actually. Quite large. In fact, one of the reasons why I'm even doing this video, I'd already planned on doing this video a few months ago, done the legwork on some research, but just recently, I've had no less than five people showing up in my comments in the past month. 
saying, yeah, well, you think you have all the answers? German new medicine, bitch. Okay. Here you go. And that's kind of how I can judge the tide of these things. Is there enough wackadoo desperate people who are going to think of, of, of this absolute lunacy as legitimate? And if there is, then I'll make a video on it. And so I am. And I'm very happy that I am because this is some wacky shit. And anytime I can basically piss on the grave of some dude who caused the undue suffering and misery of families, ugh, well, I'm just a happy camper. Wait, I'm not a happy camper. I'm a happy doctor. Anyway, that's going to be it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate you. Hope you are well. Hope your family is well. And from mine to yours, fuck German New Medicine. And I will see you next time, all right? Bye-bye.